Juanita always wanted to be an artist. She loved drawing and was attracted to anything creative. But she didn't come into her watercolor career until she completed her first career as a public school teacher. Now, I'm always interested in finding out what someone taught prior to a career in art. And uh, so I, of course, I asked Juanita and she taught both preschool and parent education. Uh, and then after that career uh, as a public school teacher in Oakland, she began her journey to become a watercolor artist. Juanita loves being outside and has a strong attraction to plein air painting. The feelings and impressions that she gets from nature become the genesis for her abstract explorations. She told me that she's always wanted to push the envelope by doing things that are unique. And this, this applies not only to her art, but to life as well. She tries to explore ideas in ways that haven't been done before. She takes risks and makes art that is totally personal. This led her away from the literal to painting in a more abstract form to capture the essence of the subject. It was a gradual evolution that came with learning, focus, concentration, painting a lot, and being true to her own art vision. The landscape is reflected in all of Juanita's watercolor paintings. Her experiences in nature provide inspiration and content for her exploration of natural forms with lots of texture and intense color. Juanita has had her paintings and articles in several magazines. And I thought it was interesting that she's also had her paintings displayed as the cover for a jazz CD and also a wine label. Uh, wouldn't it be fun to walk through your favorite wine shop and see a wine bottle with your art on it? I think that would be pretty cool. Uh, she recently had one of her paintings juried into the De Young Museum in San Francisco entitled Light on the Past. It's a part of her Grand Canyon series, which derives from a rafting and hiking trip that she took to the Grand Canyon and the Colorado River. It was selected from over 11,000 entries to fit the theme of living on the edge. Let's welcome tonight's demonstration artist, Juanita Hagberg. Juanita? Thank you so much, Michelle. I really appreciate that introduction. It, it was very nice. I'd also like to thank Pat. And before we get started, Michael Friedland, David Saviano, and Leslie Wilson also were real helpful in getting me up to speed on cameras and layouts and so on for a Zoom presentation. So thank you to everybody. Uh, everybody in CWA is always very helpful to one another, so I appreciate that. Uh, as Michelle said, I have evolved into being a very experimental painter. I, I work from my heart, my experiences, my emotions, and that whole idea of a personal vision is really important to me. I, I don't want to do something that somebody else has already done. I want to do something not even that I've done before, but keep pushing, pushing, pushing and working all the time. I like to paint what something feels like instead of what it, it is a literal uh, rendition of what something looks like. So I like the unexpected, I like the unpredictable, and I like to try and be creative uh, all the time. So I'm, 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 as Michelle said, I'm in, inspired by nature. I love the planar paint, but I gradually become a more abstract painter, even though I still love to go outside and, and do plein air. Uh, my paintings almost always involve rocks, trees, and water, and they're very organic, not, not geometric. So you would see that in, in my paintings. Uh, what I would like to talk about tonight is Yupo paper. I'm going to talk a little bit more about what that is, but first I'm going to show you what I use to paint with. Uh, I use a palette, and so I'm going to switch over to another uh, camera. Okay, there we go. See that? All right. 
So I yeah. use a standard, standard palette. I use the same palette that, uh, inside. And, and if I go out and plein air paint, it's the same palette. So I use that. Uh, I use two watercolors. And I usually use uh, like Daniel Smith, my favorite, when burned orange. Uh, I also use Da Vinci paints, which uh, I, think, I think is pretty good quality for uh, not being Daniel Smith, which I absolutely love. And it, it like, like many of you, when I first started painting, I was shocked at the price of a tube of paint. And of course, you're more shocked now because they're a lot more expensive. But, uh, you know, a little bit of paint goes a long way. And uh, it's important to get good paints when you paint. So I also use... Uh, P.H. Martin's, Dr. P.H. Martin's liquid watercolors. He calls them hydrous watercolors. And they're like this. They come in smaller uh, containers also, but I happen to like this one out size. And those I really like for painting on Yupo. I also use Blick. Uh, if you want to go with something very inexpensive and uh, try these out, they're, you know, they're a good alternative. The colors look very different uh, from using uh, either your tube watercolors or hydrous watercolor. For example, okay, there's an example of the Blick watercolor. Here's an example of a tube watercolor, both red. You can see the difference. However, you might like my for different things. Oops, we had an echo. Okay, so um, so we've got that. I also use a water, a spray bottle of water. I use a spray bottle of alcohol when I'm working. Rollers. Most of you probably have something like this around. Here's a, here's a brayer. And you can also use a scraper. None of these are things that you need. What you really need are paint and you need some brushes. So for the painting I'm gonna do, a flat brush, another flat brush. This one's a little stiffer, a little more flexible. And this one holds a really nice point. I think it's in a Skoda and this one. Don't even need all of these. Two, two brushes would be fine. So tonight, if you, if you happen to have some UFO paper and want to paint along, you're welcome to do that. It's not exactly a paint along demo, but you can mess around with the with uh, UFO as, as we're talking about it. <clears throat> So in my quest to get more abstract, uh, and as my painting evolved, I discovered Yupo. What is Yupo? Yupo is actually a plastic, and it's a polypropylene. Uh, it's very smooth, very unpredictable. You can get great textures, great values. Uh, it comes in things like uh, different sized uh, pads like this, this happens to be an 11 by 14. It comes much smaller. And the neat thing is you can go all the way up to five feet by 30 feet in case you have a really big space to work and you have some really big ideas that you want to uh, deal with. So here's a piece of opaque UFO. Opaque UFO is like this. And the other kind of UPO that you might like to try is a translucent. The translucent, as you can see, you can see through it somewhat. It's, it's just a different kind of surface and has, uh, you see that, there we go. Hmm. So it has different effects and it's kind of fun to try out both. 
the, um, the opaque UPO is a little bit uh, heavier and doesn't bend as much as the opaque. The opaque is much thinner. So the, the one thing is paper, the paint is actually going to sit on top of your paper. And I call it paper, even though it's a plastic, uh, totally smooth and the paint will sit on top. It does not absorb into the material like it would on watercolor paper. So that's a real consideration. It's a plus and it could be a minus depending on how you paint. And you've got to really learn what it can do, what it can do with your style of painting. I tend to paint uh, much more abstractly on this, but you could paint in a representational fashion also. It really depends on what you want to do. I don't do it when I plan air paint. Uh, I like to work flat because as I said, the paint sits on top of the surface. So if you painted uh, like you would normally with watercolor paper and you're outside, it's gonna drip down all over the place. You'd, I think you'd have a real mess, at least I would. So I don't use the planer, I use it in the studio. Um, and generally I like to work uh, much bigger on this particular uh, paper, this particular surface. I like the surprises that it has. I like the textures that you can create, which we're gonna uh, experiment with a few of those. I like the values. And uh, I, I think it's really kind of neat because if you don't like something, you can totally wipe it off. And that's something you can't do with watercolor paper. So you can have very large works, you can have representational, you can have abstract works, very large works. And if you don't like what you're doing, wipe it off or wipe off part of it. So I think that's, those are kind of fun things that you can do with this particular paper. <clears throat> I wanna show you a couple of things and I'm just gonna put some water some water on this. And this is the opaque. We're just going to put a little bit of water on this. And one of the things is in general, you're going to work a little um, with a little more paint, a little less water in a lot of cases. But right now I'm just going to, I'm putting on some water so you can see. And I'm using right now, I'm just dipping into my uh, tube paints. So that's tube. All right, now let's see what would happen. I'm actually going to pour this. This is the Blick, which as I said was less expensive. So as you can see, it looks much more intense than the tube watercolors. This is just what they call blue. And as you, you can see how thick it is right here. So it almost has this thick consistency as you take it out of the bottle. Now let's see what the hydrous watercolors will do. And this is an ultramarine. So in the blue, you're not seeing much of a difference. And you see they all are very you know, smooth. You see a real difference just in the ultramarine uh, out of a tube on this particular paper. So it's, it's something to uh, experiment with and say, well, where, where do I wanna go with this? Now, you've got these little splotches going on here where you have 
uh, places where the paper has, has resisted the paint. And that's probably an indication that you've got some uh, oil on your fingers or in the handling of the paper, uh, somebody else got oil on, their, on the paper too. So what you can do with that, <clears throat> you can use a little bit of alcohol and you can either wipe off your paper ahead of time or you might decide to scrub it while you're working. You can do it that way or in this case, sometimes you can rub it huh. just with your brush. You come back, rub it out. It's going to press out the bubbles, the little splotches that you don't want in there. Now, you may decide that you want those for uh, some texture or something. Now, I just rubbed this out with a little bit of alcohol, and of course that resisted uh, <clears throat> the paint. That's another effect that perhaps you want. Juanita, what is the name of the Blick product that you mentioned? Yes, it's Blick Liquid Watercolor. And which uh, was the stripe that you did with that? Uh, that was this one, the middle, the middle one. Okay. The middle one. Now, it, as I said uh, before, here's here's a red that's uh, Daniel Smith. Here's a red that's Blick. See the difference? Yeah, there's a big difference there. Big difference. So different colors are going to have. Uh, a different reaction and that's just something you know you either you either go with what you just put down and you say wow I like that I can I can work with that or you go to a different color and you know something's more to your liking in terms of thickness. Interesting so you at, when you're doing a painting you use all sometimes you'll use all three in the same painting? Sometimes I will yes not always but sometimes you know it's it's some people will say, well, uh, is that a cobalt blue or is that an ultramarine or is that uh, <clears throat> a verdider blue or something else? And for me, that doesn't matter so much, you know, unless I want something that's really going to, going to granulate. But um, I might decide, for example, on this one, which was the PH Martin Hydrus watercolor that I just, you know, I want to use those places where the paint was pushed away. So, you know, again, it's, it depends on what your objective is. Now, you could also take this, and if you have enough water on it and so on, you can get it to blend. And, and let it mingle just by having the, the various paints touch. See, wow, so it's way. actually kind of rolls down uh, right. with the gravity. Right, now, if you had that uh, on, a, on a slant while you're painting, you, <laughs> you might have much more drip than you want in your painting. So I like to do more control where you're going to, uh, you know, say, use your brush to help it along, or, you know, paint right next to each other. And then that will give you a sense of, uh, you know, having the paint mingled together very easily. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a fun kind of thing to be able to just uh, <clears throat> uh, mess around, see what happens. Now here's some blooms that are coming up on this part and on this part. And you might say, well, that's kind of interesting. What some people do, and they call it abstract, is, okay, this is an abstract painting. In my view, that doesn't work, but that's just, that's me. Um, I think if, if you started and you were um, pouring paint on or dabbing paint on water, and then you came up with this or something else, you might get some really interesting effects. But to me, that's not a finished painting and you got to go further. And that's where the work and the thinking and everything else comes in. So Juanita, um, uh, yes. with regard to that uh, Blick uh, watercolor uh, 
that product, can that be used on regular watercolor paper? It, it can It can be. And it's, <clears throat> I, I'm sure a lot of teachers use it for classroom things because it's so inexpensive. Oh, um, I see. You know, this, this uh, let's see, a set of 12 of these is like $80 for the hydrous watercolors. And, and these are like four or five dollars a piece. So uh, this is eight ounces. This is one ounce. So, you know, it's different products and uh, different, you know, maybe ways to use them. I like something like the Blick because it's a good way to start on, on uh, trying something like, you, uh, you know, paint on Yupo. And mm -hmm. one of the things that you can do and you're not investing a lot of money in that which I always think is a good thing. With regard to the UPO paper itself is, you mentioned that there were two different uh, surfaces, but yes. is there really only one brand? Is there only one place that makes it? Is that why? Le you Legion, Legion, the company makes it. It's a Japanese company and, you know, they make it in different weights. Uh, this is a uh, 74 pound and they make it heavier weights. I think 74 is, is fine for most things that people want to do. But uh, again, you can experiment with different ones. You can also get in sheets that are say up to 26 by 40. So um, I, I like to work on that. But again, you have to, you know, you have to decide what's good for your type of work. So if, one of the things you might want to do after you get paint on to your paper is you, you could use a tissue, for example, and you could either do it like that with your hand. Now you come up with some interesting texture. Wow. Or you could uh, put it down and you could use your roller that we talked about roll it, more pressure, different. So you could say, well, uh, do I want to do something to make, again, make this into a painting or do I want to <laughs> just say, wow, those are really cool effects and I would go with that. You know, again, depends on how you paint, what you want to do. Here's that brayer. You can push paint around with that. Now you notice again, we're getting that resistance. Mm -hmm. So you could either leave it or you could rub it out or you could brush it out. And you have lots of options. And the neat thing is, if you like to mess around with things and say, where can I go with this? Uh, I always think that the painting leads you. Even when you're, I don't, let's see, I don't paint from photographs. I don't do a preliminary sketch when I'm uh, working and you know a lot of people do but I like to say once you start painting even if you're outside plein air painting I want to see where the painting takes me and it's it's going to have to be my painting in the end not a photograph so uh, again there's different ways to work it's the way I work and you can and see that you can get all kinds of neat sort of effects with things like that. Now let's, let's try a few more things that uh, will give us some texture. So what I'm gathering from what you're saying is that um, it's very much more forgiving because you can uh, play with it, erase it, wipe it, uh, add more, whatever. Yes. It's, it doesn't just dry like regular water paper does. For it. Right. And, and you can, I can take it to the sink and wash everything off too. So again, uh, you'll have some staining colors. If you use a, a thalo, for example, you're going to have some staining and then it's, it's going to have sort of a ghosting of whatever color uh, like that you were using. And what you can do then is take that alcohol and either wipe it off with a paper towel, or you can take something like, you know, your trusty Mr. Clean will come to your rescue uh, and get off. Uh, this is an eraser sheet. 
Huh. Which is new. In fact, I haven't even opened my little box here. But um, yeah, I've never seen those before. Yeah, I saw them someplace, and as I said, I haven't opened them up, but it's you know a similar kind of thing. So you can get rid of something like a, a phthalo uh, and so on. The other thing so does it does it excuse me does it take yeah. a, a lot longer to dry and can you use a hair dryer to dry it with <clears throat> I don't use a hair dryer some people do I would not put it very close because it will both push away that paint because it's on this slick surface sure uh, and and so you've got that issue and also if you got a really high heat you could um, buckle your paper this paper is going to stay nice and flat. I don't tape it down. I don't clip it or anything else. But if you used a hairdryer and it was quite hot and you got very close to this, you know, you could uh, disfigure your paper. So okay. you, you just want to be aware of, of that. Now, so if you wanted to, well, let's see, before I do that, let me just show you something. Okay, so you've got some alcohol in the spray bottle, for example. Wow. So, you know, you, you could drop alcohol, you could spray it. And that's, you know, one way to get some texture into your painting. Uh, again, do you want to leave it like that? Or do you want to, you know, come in and do something else that, that, change, that uses the texture, but also changes it. So it's not so predictable. Um, you mentioned <laughs> drying and that's one of, that's one of the, uh, it's a challenge with you both. It's not necessarily a detriment or anything, but it, it can be a real challenge and that is it takes a long time to dry. And if you're in a humid area or you're in an area that's uh, cold and damp, it's gonna take much longer to dry. And later on, we'll talk about uh, how you present these things and what you do about the drying process and how that figures into how you present things. So um, we'll do that later, but it does take a long time to dry. And for example, if I were to pick this up, and I had painted to my edge and I picked it up. What are you gonna see? You're gonna see fingerprints along the edge. So you come back in and you're gonna, you're gonna get rid of those by painting over them. So you wanna handle that carefully, you know, if you're carting it off somewhere to dry. And you ever all use fingerprints uh, to, uh, make marks on the yeah, paper? Sure, you can. Uh, huh, uh, yeah. You, do, you can. So, you know, you, it's, it's great for messing around on. Uh -huh. uh, and, and you know, obviously you get the unexpected and you get mm -hmm. unpredictable things. And in general, you're not going to have the same, same look twice at the same painting twice nor what and why would you want to have the same painting twice but um <clears throat> it, it's something that you as an artist need to work with how, how do i bring whatever i've started to a resolution and create a painting so let's get some more paint on here so how long does it actually take to dry? Like if you had decided you were done right now um, and you wanted to wait for it to dry, how long would it take? Uh, it can take weeks. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, I, you know, sometimes it's, it's like you have, say, maybe it's three weeks and it's dry and you're looking at it and then you say, well, I really need to do something else to that. Uh, you know, you add, you add something else to it. And of course you change one thing, you change five things. Uh, so then you've got to um, let it dry some more. Um, I'm gonna show you though, if you, if you do, um, get the wrong, there we go, tissue. The other was a paper towel. So if you, if you do this, like what we talked about and you, two ply. So you can burnish 
what you've got going. This helps it to dry. It also helps to sort of seal it and it helps to kind of smooth it out. So sometimes depending on the color or whatever you're working with, I mean, if you're working with uh, say browns or something like that, it almost looks like burnished leather to me. Mm. When you do that, you can get it really smooth. Yeah, it's so, pretty. You know, again, it's a different, a different kind of look. And it also, it, as I said, it helps to, it helps to dry it. So you could do that again and, you know, mess around, say, well, do I look like that look? You do it without your tissue. I forgot to say, if people have questions too, as we go along, be sure and uh, pass them on. And then you, Michelle, I think you're going to tell me what the questions are. Yes, uh -huh. I have been uh, passing on some questions here as we go. Right, um, right. Sharon would like to know, can colors be blended on the paper? Yes, yes, they can. So let me... Um, show you what that might look like. In fact, I think it's, it's kind of neat to uh, blend them on the paper. I think that works nicely. And again, depending on what color you're using and so on. I'm gonna switch. Yeah, you've got a lovely blue there. We're kind of eager to see you add some other colors and see what might happen. Sure. Okay, here's a little Quinburn orange. Is that the one you mentioned was your favorite? One I of your love favorite Quinburn colors? orange, yes. Daniel Smith, <laughs> make a great one. Other, other companies make it too, but I think that's a really nice one. So here, you know, here's, here's the blue underneath and the orange on top. Now, are there times when you let a layer dry and then add more layers on yes. top? Yes. And, you know, again, as I said, you'll never get the same effect twice. Uh, okay. At least I usually don't. And, but you will get more familiar with what possibilities you might have. Okay. You know, after you mess around for a while it's one and as i said you so you wipe it off it doesn't work you wipe it off so let's let's do that now on this you see how we're getting a little bit of uh it's almost like dots because of the roller I have another kind of roller here, which is, um, this is a soft one that you've used for paint. Um, huh. it, it, it's kind of a, it, it almost feels more like a fabric than a sponge. Okay. And that's another type you could use. You can, so each different type gives a little different uh, yeah. surface to yeah. the finished. And, and also depending on, uh, say what kind of pressure you're putting on it. That makes a difference. Oh, okay. Um, you could take your, your brayer and, and <clears throat> you know, create texture like that by holding it so it's not rolling. It's just kind of smooshing it around. Oh, I see. Or, um, now, if you try, if you scratch Yupo paper, um, like with your finger, like some of us do with our watercolor paper to make marks, does it leave an indentation in the paper? It depends on how much you you do it. Now, I said it, it you know, it would. Uh, one of the things that can happen with Yupo is it it can crease. 
like if you are sloppy when you put your paper away or something and you it bumps up against something else that that pushes it in a certain way it could crease so you you could you know here's here's the end of a of a brush all right and you could do your fingernail or whatever oh, and yeah. so you, again it's going back to white you could do that you could oh You know, it's like change it so that it doesn't say, look, I scraped the paint and it's something different. Yeah. So then it kind of makes you wonder what's really going on there that right. keeps the interest level up. Right. And to me, that makes them that makes for a more interesting painting than just leaving something as is. How long have you been doing the UPO paper using that? Um, you know, I uh, I had some Yupo. I think I got, I must have gotten a pad of it. And it was probably about, oh, I, I think it was about 10 years ago. And I, I had uh, done a, a couple of things on it and I liked it, but I wasn't, you know, really thrilled. And then my, uh, my friend Vicki Ju passed away and I had given her a piece of that. She went crazy with it, with acrylic. She did some really neat things. And when, when Vicki passed away, um, I was a recipient of her huge hoard of Yupo paper. And I thought, you know, in order to honor her, I really needed to get going with Yupo and, and mess around with it some more. So I've, I've been doing a lot of it for about the last, oh, say five, six years. And then uh, I'll talk about this a little bit later, but uh, I've been working on a series for the last year and a half based on a trip to the Grand Canyon. So uh, that I've, I've worked extensively in Yupo and that I've, I've got about uh, 55 paintings now in that series. So, so do you use Yupo? plain air also or no no i don't because of the the dripping wet factor and okay. also uh, the fact that it wouldn't dry so it wouldn't be oh. maybe somebody can make it work that would be great but i i don't uh i don't fight with it out there got it do you <laughs> Do you always use the or prefer the opaque or do you sometimes use the translucent or? Yeah, I do, I do both. Um, I like, I kind of like the weight of the opaque the, uh, the most, but I, I do both. And sometimes it's a matter of, oh, I grab a piece of paper and that's what I'm start to work on. Okay. So, so would you say with the colors on UPO that the colors don't mix without some sort of physical pressure? Um, no, they'll mix. Um, like if you, is that, okay. So here's some uh, raw sienna, for example, and So if you put colors next to one another, they're going to mix, but you know, you can do your burnishing and bring them together, or you could, uh, you know, help them along by tilting. I see. I see. Now your various uh, rollers, Yes. Some of them are foam and some of them are made out of other things. Uh, this one is, um, it, it's more of a, oh, it's kind of got a little fuzz to it. Oh, this, okay. this particular one. So it's not, <laughs> I pulled this Or like out. what you use to uh, paint your wall with maybe, huh? Yeah. Oh, these are all, these are, you know, you go down to a hardware store and because it's not an art store, it's a lot cheaper. Oh, okay. So, you know, it, it's like with any other kind of painting, artists are always looking for things that will create texture and so on. Now, here's a, here's a real big one that you would use, you know, for painting. Yeah. Um, walls. And 
if you wanted to do that there. And you can also use a, a brayer, a roller when your paint is almost dry and then you can uh, use it to roll on and it gets even a different kind of look and texture. You just, huh. you know, because that paint is still, there's still a bit of dampness in it, even after a long time drying. Do you ever add plain water? To like to this? The, to, to the color that you've put down? Um, you mean afterwards? Or yeah. I mean, after you put it down? Uh -huh. Good, but let me let me show you what. All right, so remember when we scraped this and then it pushed the paint away and so on. Yes. Well, <clears throat> if you here's here's one other thing you could do. All right, so here's here's some water on my brush. All right, so there's some water. What I can also do. I can wipe it out. Oh, I see. So I, I could do that or it, or it may be part of my design that I want, or I didn't like that particular passage. What about beforehand, like with, with your your tube paints, do you use them straight out of the tube or do you water them down um, more or less before you put both, them on? I do both. Tonight I uh, watered them down. So okay. they're, they were a little bit moist and, and nice and thick and, and everything. Now I could, okay, I could take some water and remember what we did with the, uh, we did with the, alcohol mm -hmm. you got a lot of spots and you get a little bit of texture depending on how wet or how dry here's the alcohol boom wow you see That's it a huge difference <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's totally different now again i wouldn't want to, if i were saying i like these little things i personally wouldn't want to leave them i'd want to work with them and and decide what else we could do with this uh, in order, you know, to use part of it. I, I really don't like it when, okay, you use something like uh, plastic wrap or uh, wax paper. And, and then you look at the painting and you go, look, they used wax paper or they use, you know, plastic wrap. It's like, yeah. use that as a start and go further with it. So it's not obvious, it's a tool you know, to get where you want, not where it wanted to go. And, you know, to me, that's just not very interesting. Okay. Um, so like, for example, let's put this aside for a bit. Oh, let me show you one more thing. Um, so, you know, all these things that you find and you have scraps of for texture, you can certainly, let's see, there's no big brush. There's my favorite brush. Oh, there it is. All right. So you've got all this stuff going and Say you wanted some texture, you could you could just add some more. I mean, you got a lot of texture going here, but now that's on real wet stuff, so it's mm. kind of subtle. Mm -hmm. uh, coffee, these coffee holder things. Let's see what that looks like. So you could add texture when it's wet, or you could add it when it's dry and get something going like that. Again, all different kinds of things. I, uh, I know most of you have this kind of stuff because artists are big collectors <laughs> of things.
different possibilities. You know, you keep all that kind of stuff around and then you might need it sometimes. Mm. Looks all like right. fun. Yeah, so we, we said something about like a uh, plastic wrap. All right, here's here's one that was dry, had some plastic wrap on it. Okay, so you actually left the plastic wrap on it till it dried? Till it dried, and that's what I would recommend. Oh. All right, so that's kind of a, an oddball thing going on here, but if I wanted to do something else, I mean, I could say, wow, there's an abstract painting, uh, or I could, uh, you know, do something else with it. And if I, if I move the brush around, it's going to loosen the edges of, of these lines that have concentrated uh, with the plastic. Okay, so it, if you add more wet paint, the paint underneath it becomes wet again too? Yes, it will re-wet it and, and uh, kind of start dissolving that paint, paint line, for example, if I didn't want mm -hmm. that, okay, uh, whatever I, I want to do with it, maybe I want part of it. You know, all right, so here's here's a uh, cobalt violet, I think. Let's see what I got here. I think I have a cobalt violet on a red. And so you're seeing, you know, it, even after this part is totally dry, you could you bring on the, the top coat of paint and it's going to you know, get re-wet and create some different possibilities. Oh. So to me, doing something like that would be much more interesting than just leaving uh, your, you know, look, I used uh, plastic wrap. So um, somebody would like to know when you're working with this paper, and you like an area, is there a way to save it before it moves again to a different design? Uh, just don't touch it again. <laughs> okay, so you just really have to just stop touching it, stop messing with it and let it yes. dry, huh? You do that, and but I will say, you know, when you're designing a painting, uh, and you fall in love with one spot, which is inevitable. I mean, it's always like, oh, wow, that's just, you know, great. I love that. Um, you change something else. And so that might mean that the spot that you just loved will have to go because it doesn't go with the rest of the painting. And, and so I think as an artist, you're always evaluating what you're, what you're doing and how one part affects another part. And then somebody else would like to know if you if you want to paint a landscape yes. um, and make it more representational, how do you make shapes? How do you make shapes? Yeah. You just paint them. Um, you would paint really, except you're going to be painting flat, you're going to paint uh, essentially the same way you would, you would paint on paper, except it's going to move around more and uh, it, will be, it, it will be much looser. Although if you paint it very dry, if you use the very uh, dry method of painting without a lot of water, <clears throat> then it's going to be more realistic, more detailed. Or, okay. or have that possibility. So you might also do something like, uh, say, here's here's a dry, here's one that's already dry. Q-tips. You might decide to use that to to rub out paint and get a, a little more fine, or you could use a, a more of a fine tip brush to do the same thing. All 
again, I'm going to take my, that's going to lift that paint up after it okay, was Okay, so you just, you just wet it with that fine tip brush and then it, and then that paint would lift. Yes, it's going to that soften the paint and then I lift. And you could do it with, you know, say a big brush. Wow, okay. So again, different, different possibilities. You know, maybe I want to fill that in a little bit and Do you ever use any kind of resist? No, I don't. Um, I, did, I just never have had the need to. I don't do it when I'm using regular watercolor paper either. Mm -hmm. You know, some people do it and they love it and that's great, I just don't do it. I think one of the things that might be difficult for some folks is you know if you're used to drawing out your painting and uh, you know you can draw it out i think the fun of is is in not drawing it out and just going for it jump in so a lot of what you do uh compositionally is is intuitive is that right it's intuitive but it's also in my head if i'm thinking of something if i'm thinking of trees for example I have a tree in my head. I have trees in my head. So okay. and I like I like to paint more of the universal, not the specific. So it's not going to be that tree. It's going to be something that says tree in terms of uh, you know what someone is going to think of when they. That one wasn't clean, was it? So we'll do something with that. Hmm. <laughs> Do you ever um, mix colors on the palette first before applying them to the paper? You know, when I use Yupa, I, I don't. I usually do it just straight out of the tube or out of the bottle. I see. So, for example, uh, we've got this P.H. Martin Hydrus watercolor. I'm just going to dip right in the bottle. And perhaps I want, you know, some line work or something going with this. Oh, that's pretty. And you can see how intense uh, that is. Mm -hmm. And maybe I want to you know, mingle it a little bit or not. In fact, let's do that's a little coin gold. Another question here. Uh, once it dries, is there a way to seal the surface? Yes, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Let me come back to that. Would you Remind okay. me to, so we don't forget that because that's real important. Absolutely. And it's, to me, it's one of the <laughs> neat things about, about UFO and the possibilities. What's the largest size painting that you've ever done? Uh, 26 by 40. Okay. But I do have some, uh, I have some five, foot by 30 feet so I'm, I'm thinking about taking over the place and doing and doing that because <laughs> you have to have a, a big place to work yeah that would be like a mural right uh, yeah or you could cut it you know yeah use it for a wallpaper and put it on all across one wall right I'm going to clear out some of this stuff here I forgot to mention too if you you know, people could use uh, watercolor crayons. You could use watercolor pencil. Uh, oh. You could use ink. 
uh, people, some people use acrylic and so on. So there's all of those possibilities too, depending on, on what you like uh, as a painter. Okay. So, so again, it's like, um, I like to go to, uh, toward the, the abstract. And it, it's, um, it's something that, I, as I said, has really evolved. And I like the, the challenges and, uh, you know, thinking that you might have more to say. Oh, and one of the things that uh, really inspired me, as we talked about before, was I got to go on a lifelong dream trip to the Grand Canyon. Um, I was on a rafting trip, hiking trip, and it was an incredible challenge, both physically and uh, you had all kinds of emotional responses. And you're, you're in a place that's two billion years old. Uh, and to me, that has a real effect, <laughs> at least it did on me. So the fact that I like rocks, trees, and water, I got mostly wa water and rocks uh, in terms of what was going on in my head. And I, I wanted Joe, if you can uh, switch and, and show the first one, Joe, light on the past. Okay, that one's up. That was, uh, that was the one that was uh, selected for the De Young Open. And I was uh, uh, actually just amazed that that, that that happened. And that was uh, one of the first ones in my series of the Grand Canyon. And I decided to do a series because the, the whole idea of the canyon was so big and so vast, it couldn't be captured in my mind in, in one painting. So. Uh, I started on this quest to do a series. There it is. Wow, that's amazing. I, it, it was fun. And that one is like uh, two by three in terms of size. And that's on, and that's on you both. Joe, do you want to bring up the next one, please? Along the Great Unconformity. There's another one. So you can see that you can get really intense color. You can get a lot of texture. You can get line. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's room if you work big <laughs> to get some big ideas down. How about the next one, Joe, please? Okay, this one's got a lot of texture in it. Uh, more blue than I normally use, uh, especially in this series. Um, but it reminded me of the, of the water and the challenges of the water and, uh, you know, kind of the layers of, of rock and so on. But when I paint, I like to bring a whole emotional response to something. And it's just, you know, you have to throw yourself into what you're painting. And again, this is not... Uh, one rock or one formation or anything like that, but it's a series of things in it. And it all comes together, I hope, in something like this. Uh, Joe, do you want to show the last one? In Christina Chandler? says that she loved that one so much. Oh, thank you, Christina. <laughs> Thanks. And here's another one. Um, again, you can get, uh, I, I mean, this one, you would uh, it'd be easy maybe to see some of the layers of paint. Someone asked me about layers before. Yes. And this is several layers. And again, you, if, <clears throat> when I get a, a more abstract piece done, just like I would evaluate if I were doing a more realistic piece, uh, you look at it after a while and you say, well, <laughs> you know, it's not working or it is working. And you can always add more. You can change it. You can wipe it out. You can uh, do more rubbing with your uh, foam roller and come up with, a, you know, a change to your painting. So, so uh, I, this, this could apply to any of these paintings, but just looking at this one, like what tools and techniques did you, did you use here? Okay, I uh, put on paint uh, and this one, uh, it's got a lot of quin quinacridone burn orange. It's got quin gold and, and it's got some violets and, it, and it's, got, uh, it's got black in here. And this is interesting because I never use black when I paint 
uh, on watercolor paper. I always uh, mix my blacks. And on UPO, I, I really love the blacks that come out of uh, Dr. P.H. Martin. And I even like the Blick black, which turns out to be more of a gray. So um, I used all of those kinds of things, I used the brayer. And uh, you can see on some of the uh, parts where the, the paint would mingle with sort of the next edge and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so this one would also remind me of uh, <clears throat> the history of, of, of the life that, that was in the canyon and the layers of rock and, uh, but also the intense sun, the intense um, sort of atmosphere. You're, you are so surrounded by serious atmosphere in that place that it just, it has to have an effect on you. And in my case, it's had to come out. Okay, thank you, Joe. So I wanna show you, when I was in the canyon, I took my paints and you are really under adverse conditions. You got sandstorms, windstorms, uh, 112, 115 degree heat. Uh, you're tired, <laughs> you're worried, am I gonna fall off a mountain or, or a rock formation or whatever, but I wanted to paint. So I painted some little sketches. I'd sit down in the sand and, and paint. So I just wanted to show you a couple because those were the outcomes of, of and these th kinds of impressions. And these are uh, regular watercolor paper. These are, right? yeah, these are just uh, okay. watercolor on watercolor paper, you know, with a tiny little kit that I took along. Mm -hmm. So and did you backpack in there? Uh, no, in no, I didn't backpack in. Uh, I we did the 15, a 15 day trip, which means that you start on the water and then you, you go out on a bumpy bus. Um, oh. But you can, if you take a shorter trip, you either hike down or you hike out. Neither of which really appealed to me. Okay, so let me, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do a little bit of uh, painting on some things, but I wanted to read you a little statement that Pablo Picasso made. And <clears throat> excuse me, for those of you who are in the uh, San Francisco Bay Area and you get a chance to go to the De Young, the Calder Picasso uh, exhibit is on it, it's fabulous. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it, especially the Calder part uh, with his mobiles. Um, but Picasso said, each time I begin a painting, I had the feeling of leaping into the void I never know whether I'll land on my feet. Only later do I evaluate more exactly the effect of my work. And I really feel, uh, I feel what he was saying because that's sort of what happens when you uh, start an abstract painting or at least when I start an abstract painting because you, you jump off a cliff, so to speak, and you have to kind of see where you're gonna end up. And again, that's, the part of the process of, uh, of working with what the paint gives you and what you've started. So I started a few things and I wanna, let's, let's see where we can go with some of these. So here's one that might, you know, in my mind probably uh, had Canyon in mind for this one. And so, I wanted to uh, actually just wipe some stuff out and didn't finish this one so we could kind of mess around with it and see where we could go. Don't know whether we'll finish it again because of the drying uh, process. So let's see. So um, I have somebody asking if, if it's possible to use masking fluid or uh, does this also not dry very quickly. You know, I, as I said, I've never used it. I don't use it even when I do watercolor. Uh, so you've just never tried paper. it. So I would try some and, and see what it does. But the fact that you can wipe out and even really detailed, if you get good at it, you can wipe out the things. Uh, you know, say, say I didn't like this and I wanted to wipe it out. You know, we're going to go in again with our 
tissue and water. Oops, except if you do a clean tissue, it works better. <laughs> so you could you could do you know wiping out and you could you could get very detailed if you wanted to. So in some ways it's like you probably don't need the masking fluid. It would be a I see. Sure. Personal preference, you could do it. I don't I don't think you need to. Let's put it that way. Do you offer workshops uh, using the Yupo paper? I would. <laughs> I would. <laughs> if, we, if we want one, we should talk to you about it. In you other should words. talk to me about it. Yeah, or people can contact me. Yeah, okay. And once the Yupo paper is dry, can you roll it up to ship it? You could. To somebody? Yeah, you, know, you can painting. do that. Again, okay. you don't you don't want it you you don't want it to get creased. So okay, that's the deal, and you know you'd want to be uh, careful about that and make sure that uh, the instructions are there to make sure somebody doesn't crease it. You know, one of the things that I, I want to mention um, is that I think it's really a help to people and important uh, if they can find a mentor, somebody that helps guide them on their art journey. Uh, I've been really fortunate in my life to uh, have had two mentors. One, Mary Spivey, uh, who is not with us, but I know she's watching down on us and uh, Liz Hamlin. Uh, and these two people are very dear, dear friends and mentors for me to me. And I feel incredibly lucky to have had that experience. I would certainly recommend you latch on to somebody who's willing to help guide your art journey. And one of the things that I found, which I had no idea when I first started painting, was that artists are extremely generous in their knowledge and uh, information, help, support. So I hope you've had that experience too. Okay, so, so you know, I will look at something like that and say, well, is that gonna work or do we need something else? But you know, it's probably gonna come after, after a while. It's gonna work as a painting. Hmm. Pat says beautiful. Oh, hi. <laughs> thank you. And I have somebody here asking, how do you find a mentor? Um, well, it, you know, one of the things that people might wanna do is join some art group. I mean, it might be a, a group like CWA. It might be uh, a critique group. It might be a plein air group. And it's, it's a matter of find somebody who's better than you are, who's willing to be a friend and who tells you the truth. <laughs> I think that's mm -hmm. an important kind of thing. But as I said, I think people are real generous and they, they kind of surprise you in terms of their generosity because uh, I, most people are very giving. So a lot of my more abstract pieces, I believe have sort of a semblance of reality to them. I mean, they, I, don't, I don't work from photographs. I don't pre-paint. Uh, they all come right out of my head. But I'm, you know, I'm thinking about something. I'm thinking about an emotion. I'm thinking about an experience. Mm -hmm. um, and so on. So let's put that one aside because that, that you know might change after I get it uh, dried. 
and I might want to add something or I might want to fiddle with it some more even when it's wet. Oops, I see one thing here. Oops. How do you know when something is finished? Uh, it's sort of like you, you look, you know, I like to look at things and then sometimes even quite a long time later, you go, oh my gosh, I missed that part. It's sort of like when you can't do anything else to make it better. It, and you know, I believe you know, after you've painted a while, you know when it, it says what you wanted it to say. If you added something or took something away and it would, you know, and that wouldn't do anything for it, then, then you're done. Uh, you know, look at it in a mirror, you'll see it. Turn it upside down. Uh, those kinds of things can help. But I think intuitively after you paint it a while, you know whether it's working or not. Did you start out by taking classes or? Um, you know, I, I, took, I took a class. Uh, it was a, uh, about a six weeks class from Pablo Becano Laura, oh. who uh -huh. is a fabulous painter. And he is even better than that. He's a really nice person. And <clears throat> so I, I did that. I truly, I didn't know what brushes were. I didn't know. <laughs> What, what to get for supplies or anything. And I remember the very first class was pouring down rain. I came and I think I was the only person and Pablo was there and he said, well, I guess you could start painting now. And I, I said, I don't have any brushes. I don't have any paints. I don't know what to do. You know? <laughs> so anyway, uh, it evolved from there, but he, he's a great person to know. And, and if you've signed up for any of his uh, classes, I think you'll enjoy them. Okay, let's... Yes, I, I have taken a class from him and it was awesome. And I know Pat is uh, taking one now and really enjoying it too. Right. Well, um, here's one that's a little more realistic. And uh, I started this one. I even, <laughs> my problem is I have a hard time stopping. If I start to paint and I want to get something so that I could show you what's going on, I have a hard time stopping. So that's just the fault of mine. I think it needs some uh, plant life over here. You know, this scrubby stuff that grows along uh, the canyon. Can you imagine two billion years? I mean, <laughs> I, I just, that just goes through my mind and it's mind boggling to me. Let's do, can you see that? Those are both sap greens, two different sap greens. Isn't that crazy? So anyway, they're mixed. Huh. That's, you know. Ah. And I wanted it to do this one just, you know, so you could see that you could be more realistic and obviously it could be more realistic than this. <clears throat> That's lovely. Thank you. Do you ever use salt for texture? I don't on this and I don't usually use it on watercolor paper. I think it would just help to keep things wet and not dry, oh. um, so I don't, I personally don't think you need it. Okay.
I think um, it's a really important when you paint that you bring your emotional reaction to things into your painting. And the more you can do that, I think the more authentic your painting is. I know that when I was in the Grand Canyon, uh, <laughs> it, there were times that are kind of terrifying in terms of the experiences you have with certain places you hike and so on. It's like, I'm, I'm not real fond of heights and I have a depth perception problem with my vision. So when you're up on some of these mountains and things, you, you're almost terrified, but um, that probably comes out in your painting and I think it helps to define your work. Huh. So anyway, something a little more realistic and you can do. The other thing I wanna show you so that I don't forget to do it when we come back to a little more painting is this one, and it'll probably run, is on a board. Okay, this one, where somebody asked about how you present something or how you finish it or frame it yeah. or frame it and so on. Um, so this one is on a board and it is adhered to the board with uh, acrylic that um, easy this uh, matte gel. Now, there's a lot of controversy about various ways to do this. Uh, one is that a lot of watercolor associations, for example, want to have things uh, framed with mats, under plastic, and so on. So there's, there is that. And uh, one of the options you can have when you're doing paintings on UPO is that you could mount it on something like this and it is sealed. I always seal mine because what do we say? The paint never really dries and it could be wiped off. So you would hate to have your painting uh, have a smudge on it or uh, the, the plexiglass gets broken and then all of a sudden your paint's running all over the place. So I do seal them. And if you're a purist, you won't seal them but I have no idea how you're going to deal with that. Uh, and what I seal them with is I use a Krylon UV resistant clear. And I do a couple of coats after it's really dry. And that might mean a week or two of drying. Uh, and on a dry day, I do this outside and I do a couple of uh, light coats that are about you know 12 inches or so above the painting do that back and forth, up and down. And then I use Kamar varnish or Kamar varnish. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Um, <clears throat> it's non-yellowing and it's a sealer, uh, but it comes out a little bit uh, uh, glossy. So then after that's dry of a couple of coats, I'm probably gonna put some more of the UV uh, clear on it because that will give it a matte coat. You could get this in gloss, I use matte. <clears throat> so the, the board I was talking about mounted a piece with the matte gel on board, which has been primed and a couple of coats of primer. Uh, because what did we talk about before? We said uh, some of this uh, UPO paper is translucent or transparent and you can see through it. So you wanna make sure you have a nice white background that you're putting it on. Otherwise you, you would see wood below or whatever it is you've got on there. So that's- so What kind of board is that? This, this is a piece of uh, plywood, smooth plywood. And oh. you, could, you can go to uh, an art store and get cradle panels that are already put, you know, they're already primed and so on, or you can use something like a kills uh, to prime it. Now there's, there's a whole thing about, do you really want to mount fine art permanently? Uh, and a lot of people are really against that and don't want to do that. So that's something you have to consider if you want to do that. Uh, the other thing is I have had Many, many, many <laughs> times when I've tried to use a, a matte gel to, to adhere a painting and it won't stick. So 
if you read up on it with a Legion paper who produces UPO or you go to a, a person like Chris Paschke who does uh, designs, ink, art, she writes extensively on adhering, uh, adhering uh, uh, paintings to board and she does not recommend it. And Golden doesn't recommend it. They say that they would not guarantee their products to adhere something. So I look at it as an experimental process. You have to probably consider that if you were going to mount something. And also, I think if you mounted something very large, you would have a lot of trouble. So you sealed it. You technically don't have to use Plexi for glass. Um, <clears throat> if you did for a show or something, or because you prefer doing that, you're going to use a spacer because you're probably not going to be using a mat. So you're going to have to use a spacer between the plexi and your painting. Oh, okay. We have a few more minutes, I think. Yes, so we do. Let's, uh, let's mess around with some more. So here, I don't know whether any of you have had the great fortune to go to a place called Rialto Beach and it's up in Washington state and it's uh, on the Olympic Peninsula and the winds blow so hard there that the sands of trees are the bark and everything is sort of blown right off and it, it sort of almost has a ghost effect with the trees. Anyway, it's a very fascinating place. In fact, if any of you have read or heard of the Twilight series of books or movies, uh, that's the area where that, those took place or, and were filmed, uh, the hmm. movies. So anyway, it's, it's a really neat, a neat place. So this is what I'm thinking of when I do something like this. I'm thinking of Rialto Beach. However, this could be any beach I mean, this, or any stand of trees. I mean, you wouldn't even know it's a beach because I'm not going to paint the beach. So uh, again, it's your painting, your idea. And I always feel that the viewer brings something to your painting. So whatever is going on in your mind, that contributes to the whole process too. I remember I was, I was in a, sh uh, a show one time and I noticed somebody had bought a painting of mine and they uh, were going out the door and I said, oh, thank you for buying my painting. I said, it was a plain air painting. I said, do you know where that is? And they said, no, but it uh, looks like someplace I'd like to be. And that really made an impression on me that it didn't have to be one place, it didn't have to be uh, anything specific. That's a very good point um, where you can let the observer um, fill in pieces with their mind and yes yep I, I think that's you know it was a good lesson to me when I was starting out to to really think about that because I don't I don't know whether I never thought of that before so you, you know you learn a lot from people who are observing your work mm -hmm. Well, you certainly make it look like fun, like it's something I want to try. You know, it's got to be fun because otherwise, why would you do it? You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, even if it if if it makes a nice product, if you don't enjoy the process, what's the point, oh, right? Oh God, I, you know, I just get so excited when I paint. I, I was talking about that class I went to that uh, Pablo was teaching. And I, I, it was a night class and I, 
what I was so excited. I'd go home and I would literally, I just, I'd paint for hours at night. And I, there were other people in the class that I, I really didn't know, but I think they'd been there a long time. And I'd come back with my, they were kind of pathetic, uh, you know, attempts. But I was so excited about doing it. I, I, I thought, my gosh, I waited my whole life to do this. I was so excited. And a lot of these folks, it, it was just, okay, we'll come to a class. And I don't know that they were real interested in going further. And I, I couldn't even understand that mentality at the time. <clears throat> So you see, the paint is mingling here, and it's mixing and so on. I see, absolutely, yeah. And, cool. You know, again, you can uh, you could do that. Now here's some more water going into that, so that's going to kind of do a pushback of some of it. That's gonna back a little bit. And So you mentioned you use black. Do you use white paint at all? Well, again, I don't use white paint when I'm painting, <clears throat> excuse me, unless um, once in a while I use a little white gouache. But um, the other thing you could use if you wanted to is if you buy one of these really expensive sets from H. Martin, you can use the white that they have. So let's see what it would do. I don't use it, as I said, on regular watercolor paper, uh -huh. but it can get some interesting effects. You see how that's kind of squiggling yeah. around and almost creating bubbles and things? Yeah. So you could use that. Um, there's something called, it's put out by Daler Rowney and it's called Pro White. I think they use it for sign painters and it's more like a gouache. Um, you could use that too, if you wanted. Again, you, with UPO, you know, you're with the ability to wipe out stuff, you, you don't really need it unless it's for some effect. Now, it, it, that looks kind of ridiculous on that tree, but you can see how that's kind of squirting out. Yeah. And it could have an interesting effect. I, I was just wondering because a lot of times, you know, if you want a lighter color on regular watercolor paper, you just water the paint down more. Right. But you wouldn't really do that on UPO, yeah. right? You don't really need it, although um, it could give you some interesting effects. And that's that's how I would use it on UPO, uh -huh. um, but not so much because you wanted white, if that makes any sense. <laughs> so. But let's say I wanted a very pale blue. If I'm making, if I take cobalt blue and water it down a whole bunch, then I can make a pale blue in yes. on regular watercolor paper. But on UPO, I don't know that I could do it that way. Yeah, you could water it down. It would make a pale blue. Oh, okay. It would, so. Ah. Uh. So are there any more questions? 
I'd say if anybody wants to um, unmute or just hit their space bar to ask a question out loud, now's a good time to do it. Okay. Juanita, how many paintings would you work on at once since you, you're probably um, waiting for something to dry? Oh, I, I'll get, <laughs> how much space do I have? Sometimes it's five, six paintings. You know, it's a matter of sometimes it's just the logistics of, you know, do you have enough space for a bunch of big ones and then you don't step on it or something if they're all over the floor? <laughs> so um do you have any animals and like i mean i could picture a cat walking across something uh, and no. make a whole no. big change i don't have any animals right now <laughs> but yeah that can happen <laughs> Yeah, I hope people will, um, you know, go out and, and think about going a little further out of their comfort zone, <laughs> get some UPO and mess around with it. And that's really what it takes. It takes messing around. Uh, I think that you can be, you know, you find that you might really enjoy it. I love the impressionistic uh, way that you paint and uh, and, and with the bright colors. Oh, thank you. I have a question. Yes. Um, so does it matter what side of the UPO that you paint on? Um, no, uh, but I, one of the things I did, you know, when I was doing, especially this Grand Canyon series, it's such a big subject. I thought it really demanded uh, big paper to work on. Mm -hmm. And but I have done some small ones. I've done it on the, this 11 by 14, which comes in a you know the pad and so on. Uh, but I also like the 26 by 40s and uh, that sort of thing, just because it's you know the subject. So right now you're using 11 by 14. Um, right now I am because it fits in the you know on the screen to paint on. <laughs> So generally, how long do you wait for a painting to dry before you seal it with the Krylon? I would probably wait at least two weeks. And again, it depends, uh, you know, if you were in a place that was very humid, uh, it might take longer. Or if it were in the middle of winter, that's another thing is it, it depends on the season, uh, how easy it is to dry. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Juanita, are there any particular uh, galleries or places where people could go to see your work other than, of course, your website? Uh, you can go to uh, Valley Art Gallery. And right now, uh, that's in Walnut Creek. Uh, also, I'm in a, a fresh work show out in Pleasanton at the Harrington Gallery. I'm in the um, Yosemite Renaissance Show. And that's traveling around various places in the in the valley, San Joaquin Valley. <clears throat> Excuse me. It will end up at the museum in Yosemite in uh, October twenty second, I believe. And um, the be the summer. I'll be in a show in Anacortes, Washington, or at the port. So that kind of, I hope, gives people a little inkling about what UPO is like and some of the kinds of things that you could do with it. I'm certainly available for questions if people need to get a hold of me. So somebody would like to know um, 
why would you choose to work on transparent versus opaque paper? Um, it, it, it's almost like you've got to put paint on it and you, and you see. Um, some people, I think, like the, the light um, weight, lighter weight of the uh, transparent UFO. And some people might want the, the whole idea of, of showing through a little bit. Um, and that's another thing when you're, uh, when you're finishing off your painting and you've sealed the front, you want to turn it over and look at the back and you want to make sure, okay, for example, here's one, see this stuff? And this is on, trans this is on transparent. Hmm. So if you didn't clean this off before you mounted it, that would show through. And you wouldn't want that, that unless you wanted that look, and that would be something you wouldn't want to have. And so it, sometimes I think it's more of a personal preference. Sometimes it's a little bit of the look. The look can be a little bit different. Um, that one. Okay, here's one. On, this, this is the transparent. And this is uh, the other. Now they're two different paintings, so it's a little bit hard to discern what would the differences would be. Part of it's just the weight. Part of it's just sometimes you feel like there's a little bit of a difference between the two that might um, you might have better effect or might have a better effect on your own painting style. And do your brush strokes eventually blend in or do you always have to use your rollers? Um, they, they can blend in um, and, and you might want to use the roller. You can kind of see because it depends on how thickly you're putting on the paint, uh, whether you've painted you know, the paint next to each other and so on. Okay. So yeah. it's one of those things you kind of just have to try it and see what yes, works do. and what doesn't. Right, you do. Are you familiar with other UPO artists and there, are there any that you would mention that you admire? Well, I, George Ann uh, Zero Eddy, who's, who's CWA, it's, she does some really interesting, amazing work. And uh, I like her work. Um, I, I, one of the things, if you look through the internet, you see a lot of UPO, and a lot of times you say, well, why didn't they just use watercolor paper? I, I kind of think you choose your paper based on what look you want to have and what kind of a painter you are and everything. And personally, I can't, I, it just doesn't appeal to me to think of people spending a lot of time doing very detailed little uh, paintings that uh, aren't free form. <laughs> so it just, you know, it's again, it's a personal preference of mine. Mm -hmm. um, and I, uh, if you want to look at my website or get a hold of me through my website or anything, it's Juanita Hagberg watercolors.com. And um, again, if you have any questions or anything, because obviously in a, a short time like this, we can't cover everything. Just wanted to give everybody a heads up. Uh, we are recording this and we will have it up on our YouTube channel in just a couple of days. Perfect. And thank you, Joe, for all the work you do. Uh, my pleasure. You do a nice job. We're really, we're lucky to have so many talented people that help with CWA. Well, that's probably about where I want to go with this. It's obviously, it's not finished, but um, you get the idea of what you can do. Yeah, we're, uh, uh, we're about out of time here. Yes, yes. Um, so I feel like you've given us a good 
uh, place to uh, to start, giving us some ideas for some things to try and um, made it look really fun. And uh, I think that's uh, what really what you wanted to accomplish tonight. Uh, yes, that's true. So I think- I How think do you sign your painting? Pardon? I couldn't How do hear. you sign your paintings? I, I sign them, uh, depending on the painting, you could sign it with graphite, which I usually do for my watercolor paintings, or I get really jazzy and sign them with gold pen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to thank nice. CWA for inviting me tonight. Uh, I had a lot of fun, and I hope we covered enough to get you going on this particular paper. I think you'll find a lot of fun. All right. Well, uh, we Aaron, had a lot of fun just you know, watching you. Yeah, we're all on, a, you know what? We're all on mute because we're just used to muting ourselves during a presentation. <laughs> but I just wanted to thank you very much. It was uh, quite enlightening, and I uh, loved the the images that you you showed. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Everybody. Thank you, Anita. Thanks, Anita. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Very very interesting. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Wani. Yeah. I'm definitely going to try it. Good. And we've got a lot of wonderful comments in the chat that you can uh, go back through uh, okay. later too, Juanita. People thanking you and uh, really appreciating your demo. Well, great. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Juanita, we'll have to talk about a workshop. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll wait. <laughs> I, I will. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Ah, your paintings are beautiful. Thank you. And, and I do right. love Georgia's right, work. Yes, she's very good. Yes. And she's fun to paint with, too. Okay, good night. Good night, everybody. Thank good you. Night. Good night. Good night. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.